Hello and welcome, this is Notable, and today we're talking about the use of conceits and symbolism in the poetry of John Donne. Now, if you cast your mind all the way back to the very first video in this series, you'll remember that we said that Donne is a metaphysical poet. We learnt that this term, metaphysical poetry, was coined by the 18th century critic Samuel Johnson, and that it refers to a loosely associated group of 17th century poets, of which John Donne is one. We also mention that metaphysical poetry is usually characterised by the use of conceits and abnormal or untraditional symbolism. A conceit is an elaborate or extended metaphor. It's a metaphor which a poet returns to and extends. It might persist across the entire course of a poem, or just for a significant fraction of it. Samuel Johnson associated the use of conceits with the metaphysical poets. He argued that, in metaphysical poetry, the most heterogeneous ideas are yoked by violence together, by which he means that seemingly contradictory or vastly different ideas, images and themes are associated with one another in a poem. So, today we're going to analyse two poems which use conceits to convey an idea. We'll start with The Flea, and we'll conclude with A Valediction Forbidding Morning. As you can see, the conceit in the former is the flea of the title, and the conceit in the latter is a mathematical compass. So, let's start with the flea. In this poem, Dunn apostrophises an anonymous woman. He begins by drawing her attention towards a flea, which is sucking their blood. He writes, It sucked me first, and now sucks thee. As a result, their blood is mixed in the body of the flea. In this flea are two bloods mingled be. Dunn uses this idea to launch an argument intended to justify why the apostrophied woman should sleep with him. He argues that, as their fluids have already been mixed in the body of the flea, and that this way of mingling fluid is not considered sinful, being bitten by a flea is not a sin, nor shame, nor loss of maidenhead, then it is similarly as innocent to mix their fluids through the act of sex. The flea serves to emphasise how little that which thou deniest me is. To have sex is no different from being bitten by a flea, and yet this, alas, is more than we do. So, ultimately, this stanza serves to establish the flea as a conceit. Dunn attempts to persuade the woman to whom he is speaking that there is little difference between sleeping with him and being bitten by the same flea as him. Dunn is yoking together the heterogeneous ideas of a flea on the one hand and sexual intercourse on the other. Now, between the first stanza and the second stanza, the woman moves towards the flea to kill it, but Dunn stops her. He begs her to stay and to spare the flea, which has three lives within it, by which he means three different types of blood, Dunn's, the woman's, and the flea's own. He goes on to claim that, in the flea, they are almost married, before correcting himself and claiming that they are more than married. He argues that the flea is sacred, it is their marriage bed and marriage temple in one. Though their parents may dislike their romance, and the woman herself may resist sexual intercourse, they are nonetheless united in the flea, which Dunn hyperbolically refers to as these living walls of jet. Finally, he concludes the stanza by arguing that, though the woman may think she is killing Dunn in killing the flea, she is in fact killing herself as well because her blood is also contained within it. To kill the flea is therefore three sins in killing three, and those three concluding rhymes, me, be, and three, emphasise this sense of a trinity. In fact, this is a poem that's made up of three stanzas, and each stanza ends with three lines which have three rhymes. So the very structure of the poem emphasises a sense of a trinity, as well as the language. So, ultimately in this middle stanza, Dunn develops his metaphor further by arguing that the flea is sacred, and that to kill it would be sacrilegious. Then, finally, in the break between the second and the third stanzas, the woman succeeds in killing the flea. Cruelly and suddenly, she purples her nail with their mingled blood. Dunn asks his lover what the flea was guilty of, besides sucking a drop of blood from her, to deserve this treatment. 
The woman, however, triumphs in her victory and counters Dunn's arguments by pointing out that neither Dunn nor herself are weaker now that the flea is dead, though it did contain their shared blood. Dunn concludes the poem by imposing the woman's own arguments back upon her. He acknowledges that neither of them are weaker now that the flea is dead, and uses this to point out that neither of them would lose any honour in sleeping with one another. The act would be as harmless to them as taking the life of the flea was. And we have those three concluding rhymes again, be, me and thee, to mirror the mingling of their three different blood types. So ultimately, this third stanza returns to the same argument as the first stanza. The flea once again becomes a prop for logical and persuasive argument. It's a means of persuading the woman to sleep with him. Now, I think this poem, perhaps more than any other of Dunn's poems, displays Dunn's love of abnormal symbolism. The use of a flea as an erotic symbol clearly evidences Johnson's comment about the use of conceits in metaphysical poetry. Sex and intimacy on the one hand, and an insect on the other, are yoked by violence together in the poem. OK, so let's move on to a valediction forbidding morning. This poem is nine stanzas long, so I've divided it in two. A Valediction Forbidding Morning was supposedly written in 1611, when Dunn was called to France to conduct government business. The poem was written for Anne, Dunn's wife, to comfort her in his absence. As we mentioned, the central conceit of the poem is a pair of twin compasses. Over the course of the poem, Dunn likens Anne to one leg of the compass, and himself to the other. He then argues that, though they are sometimes physically separated, they remain tied together spiritually. They have a metaphysical connection which transcends space and distance. This idea is reflected in the title of the poem, A Valediction Forbidding Morning. A valediction is a speech or a statement made at a farewell. Dunn is parting from his lover, and this poem is his valediction. It's a parting speech. In this parting speech, he's forbidding his lover from mourning their separation. He's asking her not to cry or protest, but to let him leave without complaint. This is the idea which launches the first few stanzas. Dunn says that he and his lover should part from one another like virtuous men who die mildly, i.e. without protest. He writes, let us melt and make no noise, no tear floods nor sigh tempests move. So, in other words, he's telling his lover not to cry or sigh as he leaves her. These compound phrases, tear floods and sigh tempests, also serve to satirise the sentimental love that is traditionally expressed in Petrarchan sonnets. Petrarchan sonneteers typically claim that their tears form floods and their sighs create tempests. It's a trope or a cliché of the genre, and here Dunn is resisting that cliché. He argues that these expressions of emotion and distress would profane and debase their love. It would cheapen it, because it would imply that their connection is merely physical, that it relies upon physical nearness to sustain itself. He argues that this kind of purely physical connection belongs to dull sublunary lovers, i.e. other couples who are not capable of forming a spiritual, metaphysical bond. These other people cannot admit absence, which means that they cannot be separated, because their love is sustained solely by physical nearness. In other words, physical intimacy is that which elemented their relationship, and therefore when dull sublunary lovers are separated, their relationship ceases to exist. It depends on physical closeness for its existence. Dunn reinforces this idea in the next stanza, in which he argues that the love that he and Anne share is more refined than this. They don't need the physical closeness of their lover's eyes, lips and hands, because their two souls are one. Their souls are interconnected and entwined. Dunn elaborates on this by pointing out that, because their souls are one, their collective soul actually expands in size when they are physically separated. Now, I think that this is probably best explained through the use of images. So what Dunn's implying here is that other couples are like two sticks. They love being physically together. 
Indeed, their entire relationship with each other depends upon this physical intimacy. As a result, they're heartbroken when they're separated. They're miserable, as the distance between them has essentially brought their relationship to an end. If they're not physically together, there's no connection any longer. Ultimately, therefore, Dunn argues that for these lovers, their separation has caused a breach of their connection. It's broken and no longer exists. However, Dunn and Anne are not like separate sticks. They share the same soul, and therefore they're connected. Now, this line shows the size of Dunn and Anne's soul when they're together. Dunn argues that when he and Anne move away from each other, when he goes to France and she remains in England, the size of their soul grows. You can see that the red line is bigger now. So the point that he's making is essentially that just as a stretched pair of compasses is bigger than a closed pair of compasses, their soul is bigger when they're apart than when they're together. There is an expansion rather than a breach. So you can see how elaborate and detailed this metaphor is, and it's this extended detail which makes the metaphor a conceit. Now, in the seventh stanza, Dunn explicitly alludes to himself and Anne as stiff twin compasses. He claims that Anne is the fixed foot of the compass, i.e. the leg without the pencil. She makes no show to move and instead sits still in the centre. Dunn, meanwhile, is the other leg of the compass, which far doth roam. This leg leans in yearning towards the other leg and straightens back upright when it reunites with it. In the final stanza, Dunn focuses on his lover again. He says, Such wilt thou be to me. He argues that, by being this firm centre, she enables him to draw his circles and makes him end where he begun. And the rhyme on run and begun here emphasises this sense of a circular return, of coming back to somewhere where we've been before. It's worth mentioning briefly that a feminist critic may well take issue with this image of a woman remaining at home as the stable centre whilst her husband roams abroad, but we'll discuss this in greater detail in the next video, which is actually the final video in this series on John Donne. For now, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. 